Friends, I would now read to you the story of the resurrection of Christ from John chapter 20. Hear these words with fresh ears today. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabunai, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Friends, Jesus was raised from the dead. Jesus was raised from the dead. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise God for the mighty things that God did on Easter. Praise God with harps and lyres. Praise God with drums and dancing. Praise God with trumpets. Praise God with singing and shouting. For Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. Do you get that? Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. Christ is here, alive, now, in this very room, at this very moment. For Christ rules now, whether you believe it, or not. And then at the very end of history, when the clock strikes 12 and history is ended, then once again the trumpets will sound, the choirs will sing their hallelujahs, the dead will be raised, and we too shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Friends, that is the gospel. That is the good news of Jesus Christ. That is the gospel truth of Easter morning. In the Gospel of John, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Friends, I believe that. I believe that. During this season of preparation for Easter called Lent, we have been focusing on the Psalms, the the hymn book of the Jewish people and the the heart of the Old Testament, really. It, It may seem a little strange to you today that our text for Easter Sunday is a psalm, Psalm 118. 
We've heard the story of the resurrection of Jesus. But now we turn back to this psalm, Psalm 118, to to take it all in and find words to express gratitude to a God who loved us so much that He would send His one and only Son to die on the cross so that we might have eternal life. If nothing else, friends, Easter is all about death and resurrection. It's about the assurance that Jesus overcame death itself and in the process paid the price in full for our sins. And so friends, today we we gather to celebrate, to, to sing hallelujah, to give praise to our God for our salvation. And we turn to the Psalms to find inspiration. We turn to those that sang praises to this very God for their deliverance and their salvation. So if you have your Bibles with you, I want to invite you to turn to to Psalm 118 as we delve into this wonderful psalm of praise. The words are going to be also on the screens in front of you. So hear these words of the psalmist this morning. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say his steadfast love endures forever. Out of my distress I called on the Lord and the Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. With the Lord on my side I do not fear. What can mortals do to me? The Lord is on my side to help me. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to put confidence in mortals. And then on verse 13, I was pushed hard so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. And onward to verse 21. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen, amen. Friends, think of something that you are excited about doing. Think about something that you enjoy doing, something that you get excited about doing that is coming up in your life. Maybe it's a vacation, maybe it's a visit with somebody special. Think about how as the time comes for this event, you find yourself getting more and more and more excited. You begin to be filled with anticipation, right? Sometimes that anticipation can be greater than the event itself. But sometimes not. I know right now uh, in... My wife Lucy and I's life, we're, we're anticipating, we're expecting the birth of our first grandchild. And let me tell you, I'm getting excited about it. That, that perfect situation, it, it, it's coming up. That, that, and I'm just anticipating that. I'm so eager. I want it to be here, but not yet. Often what happens in those, those times when we get excited about uh, those things that we're anticipating, those things that are coming up in our life, sometimes, unfortunately, things don't work out the way we thought they would, right? It often happens, right? You, you count down those days for the thing to happen, and then when it, it gets there, It's not as exciting as you thought. But sometimes, sometimes it's extra special. Now, I I think of the excitement 
And I'm sure that we, we, we all have uh, been there, right? That excitement, anticipation of, of gathering on Sunday morning early to get up and go to church to worship God. I'm sure we all just cannot wait, right, for that. We think, hey, it's going to be great. What songs are we going to sing? What's the pastor going to talk about today? Are we going to talk about psalms again? What are we going to pray about? I don't think uh, many actually think that way. Right? I'm sure there are many here who practically have to drag themselves here. For some of you here today, this is your first time back to church in a long time. And I, I know I, it was that way when I was a child. It was an effort to get to church. And I constantly was looking for excuses to not have to go, right? Sleep seemed much more important than worship. But worship is supposed to be a joyous and an exciting thing. Something that we should allow ourselves to, to get excited about a little bit, right? And part of this is what's going on at church. But another part of it is how we come to church. Are we coming with open hearts to learn what it is that Jesus has to say to us? Or are we coming with joyful hearts ready to praise and to worship God? Or are we coming with thankful hearts remembering all that God has done for us? Friends, we are the ones who make the church. We make worship into this time of praise and prayer. So let's come to God with joy this morning. Friends, this, this psalm, Psalm 118, is all about coming into God's presence. It's all about coming into His temple. It's believed that this psalm was written by a, by a king. And that it was, it, it was read as he entered Jerusalem to thank and praise God after winning a mighty battle, victory. After being delivered from his enemies by God, it, it may also be a psalm that was sung to remember Israel's deliverance from Egypt. Either way, it's about thanking and praising God for the great things that God has done. And it's also a psalm that, that shouldn't just be read, but it, it needs to be acted out. And there are three parties in this drama that's acted out in the psalm. There's the king, right? There are the people, and then there are the ones in the temple, most likely priests. The, the psalm begins with the people. The people thanking and praising God. Give thanks to the Lord. For he is good. His love endures forever. Doesn't that just sound like a song that the people would sing back and forth as they approach the, the, the temple? It's a shout out. He calls out to the house of Aaron. What do you say? Give thanks to the Lord for he's good. His steadfast love endures forever. But what's even more interesting is that they're, they're worshiping God on their way to the temple. They don't wait until they get there. See, their, their trip to church was so exciting that they sang praise songs on the trip, right? How many of you sang praise songs on the way to church this morning? Now, don't raise your hands. I suspect getting to church this morning was much more about making sure that you got here on time or that you got everything done before church that you needed to get done before you got here, right? But that's not what the writer of the psalm recorded. He recorded a song of praise that was sung on the way, on the way to the temple. And then beginning in verse 5 and going through verse 18, some of which we read this morning, we hear about the specifics of what God did for this king. And so we hear the king himself speak and tell about what God has done for him. He answered me by setting me free. All the nations surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed back and about to fall, but the Lord helped me. And then in verse 19, the king stands outside the gates of the temple and he calls out for the priest to open up those gates. 
The priests inside the temple call out, This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. And then the king and and, and the people, they continue with their praises of God. And the priests then call down in verse 27 for the king to enter and to come into the temple in a procession with all of his people. And then the king ends by praising God again and thanking God. And the people start up their song. That song that they had been singing at the beginning of the psalm. Give thanks to the Lord for He is good. His love endures forever. Now we've got the idea about what's happening right in this psalm. These these folks made a big deal about going to worship. It was a big thing for them to go and to thank God in His temple. This isn't something that they did quietly or, or softly. Praising God is something to revel in. It's something to make a big deal about. This king was all about making a big deal about worshiping God. Now friends, some of you might say, well, Jesus told his followers to to pray in secret and to hide the, the fact that they were fasting, right? Jesus didn't want them to do things in worship that would call attention to themselves. So how does this fit in with the way that we worship? At first it seems uh, not really to mesh, right? But this king was making a big deal. But he wasn't making a big deal about himself or his followers. He was making a big deal about God and what God had done for them. He's praising, he's worshiping God and doing all he can to make sure that, that all praise is given to the one, to the the very one that had saved him. So let's look at some of the things that that are said about God in this psalm. Let's let's see this this ancient form of worship. See see how it can inform how we worship today. Some of the things just, just don't seem to apply today and others apply very well. We don't have a big gate. We don't make people call out for us to open up the doors for them to get in, right? The doors were wide open to you when you got here. I hope so. We don't have people singing hymns and praise songs together as they process through the front door. Although I might have heard a few whistles this morning as you came in. We wait until we get into the sanctuary before we begin singing, right? Part of this is cultural. Part of this is that it's just a little chilly outside this morning. Part of this is that when Jesus died on the cross, that that temple curtain was ripped in two and God made it known that there's to be no separation between us and himself. And therefore, we're welcome inside his gate. Whoever we are, no matter where we're coming from, we're welcome inside the courts of the Lord. The priest called out that this is the gate of the Lord and only the righteous may enter Friends, we are all made righteous in God's eyes by what Jesus has done for us. And therefore, we're all welcome in God's house. I want to look at a couple of the the calls that are said in this ancient worship service as well. In, in, In verse 22, we're told that the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. What an important praise that is. It's the very center of who God is and what God is capable of. If the person saying this is talking about themselves, they're acknowledging their own unworthiness. And I hear that all the time. I'm not worthy. I'm not even worthy to be in the house of the Lord. I'm a stone that was rejected by the builders, they're saying. Builders reject stones not because there's something wrong with the builders, right? But because there's something wrong with the stone. It's deemed unworthy by the very people who are supposed to find worth in it. We all feel that sometimes, don't we? We all feel that we're lacking, we feel the rejection and the pain coming from those around us, and we wonder what possibly God could do with us. 
We say to ourselves, we lack devotion, we lack skills, we lack drive, we aren't perfect, we're messed up, we're broken, we're not worthy. But friends, God doesn't let it go that simply. God takes the stone that has been rejected by the world and He uses it in a place of prominence. He uses it to build the whole structure upon, to hold the structure together. And so it is that God takes us, He uses us in amazing ways. What a wonderful thing God does. What an amazing way that God works. And we know that God is capable and God is willing to do this very thing because the New Testament over and over again applies this verse not to the people but to Jesus himself. It looks at Jesus' circumstances and it shows that this verse is describing how it is that God worked through Christ. It tells us that Jesus is the stone that was rejected by builders. His own people, his own religious leaders turned from him, rejected him. But he was made into the cornerstone. See, they rejected and crucified him. But God raised him up and highly exalted him so that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow. Friends, through him the whole church was built and the people were made right with God. Friends, God does things that are amazing. If you haven't gotten that, I hope that you will. God does amazing things. God takes the things of this world and he changes them completely. And we're called to see things with the eyes of God and not the eyes of the world. Friends, we're called not to be too hasty to judge. Because God can take us, God can take those around us whom it seems have no chance, whom it seems are unable to make any positive difference, and He can use us and He can change us. God can take the most abhorrent of people and bring them to Himself. God can take the weakest of people and give them strength. God can take the ugliest of people and make them beautiful. God can take the shallowest of people and make them deep. Don't be one of the builders who reject stones based on first glance. Don't prejudge people at first glance. Instead, allow God to work on them to make them into something great. Let God work on you. And make you into the foundation of something wonderful. Friends, the stone that was rejected became the cornerstone. God did that. And that's something to celebrate. In verse 24, we hear the psalmist say, This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It's a common phrase, one that's made into current worship today, right? Sometimes it's used as part of the call to worship. I first learned it as a song as as a child. My Sunday school teacher would say, this is the day the Lord has made. And all of us kids there in Sunday school would say, let us rejoice and be glad in it, right? Right? But don't let the fact that it's been made into a a children's song detract from its significance. It's a simple yet it's a powerful statement that the psalmist says here. There are plenty of things to praise God for. There are many reasons to rejoice today. But here we start at the beginning with the most basic. God has given us this day. This day is special. Each and every day is special and it's worth rejoicing in. It's worth praising God for. I have to admit that I don't always do the best job at remembering that. Not all days feel like gifts from God. Not all days leave me wanting to praise God. But how much of this is the day and how much of it is me? How often do I ruin a day myself by waking up grumpy? Maybe that's your experience too. 
How many days do I ruin just by failing to notice God's work in it? How about you? Friends, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Each day is special. And we have a limited number of days in our lives. This scripture is a call to make the most of every one of those days. Remember that this day, that every day is a gift to you. And celebrate that gift. Don't let it go to waste. Praise God and worship Him. But part of that praise and worship is to honor each and every day as a gift from the God who loves you. Part of that praise, part of that worship is to acknowledge God's gift to you and to do something with it. Part of that praise and worship is to find the joy that is offered in this life and to celebrate it. Rejoice. Be glad in it. Friends, mostly this psalm is about thanking and praising God. This is something that we're all about when we come together to worship, when we come together to be God's people. Friends, this is something that I'm afraid that we sometimes miss. We rush to church, we do it out of obligation, and it seems like this is particularly true on Easter Sunday. The highest of the high days of celebration. Our worship has become another of the many stresses that fill our lives. We allow the cares of our lives, don't we, which can be great, to overwhelm us, to keep us from truly coming in the presence of God. But worship is designed to be a setting where we can come into His very presence, to be in contact with the God of the universe. It's designed to be a setting where we can find joy and peace in our lives. It's designed to help strengthen us for the week ahead. And just like everything else, though, what you put into an event is going to affect what you get out of it. If you come into it half-hearted, you're going to leave half-hearted. If you come into it thinking only of the obligation, you're only going to fulfill that obligation and nothing more. But if you come in ready to meet your God, if you come in ready to learn something new, if you come in filled with excitement, who knows what God can do? So let's enter worship each and every Sunday with the gusto of that Jewish king so many years ago. Let us enter with a song on our lips and joy in our hearts. Let us enter knowing that this is the place where we come in contact with our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us enter expecting to come out of worship changed, expecting great things to happen, because God is ready to meet all of those expectations and even more. Friends, Easter is all about celebration. It's all about praise. It's all about remembering that God is our salvation. That Jesus rose from the dead. Is that not something to get excited about? Is that not something to shout about? Is that not something to give God praise about? Friends, let us remember that the Lord is our strength and our song. He has become our salvation. And may the sound of joyful shouting and salvation be in the tents of the righteous today. Friends, Christ is risen. Give praise to Him. For this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Friends, I want to hear us this morning say this. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Alleluia. Alleluia. Amen. Let's pray this morning. God, we come into your presence, Lord. We give you thanks and praise. Lord, help us to put aside ourselves and just enter in with praise on our lips today. Lord, for you, you have become our salvation. Lord, the, the, the stone that was rejected has become the cornerstone, Lord. And it's on that cornerstone that we build our lives today. Lord God, help us to sing with joy on our lips. Help us to see the victory that you give us in Christ. Amen.